May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a blessing to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Robert Frost's famous work, The Mending Wall, is a wonderful poem full of humor and a sense of sadness. It's about two neighbors who go through the same ritual every single spring, meeting at the wall between their two properties in order to repair it, to walk along the wall, to free fill the gaps that f fallen stones have left. Now these two neighbors have apparently done this for many, many years, yet it strikes the narrator in the poem to question just why it is that they have the wall in the first place. They no longer have cows or sheep that might stray onto each other's property. So why is the wall there? The reason for its purpose no longer exists, yet it remains, and they always go back and they fix it. Why? Well, because it has always been there. The truth is, it is human nature to construct walls. No age or age group has gone unshaped by the malicious power of the wall. Its menacing power moves the length and breadth of human existence. Paul calls it in our text, the dividing wall, a dividing wall of hostility. It is the wall that separates, that fragments, that isolates. It is the wall that keeps people apart. It kills fellowship, breeds prejudice, spreads gossip and sets loose the dogs of war. It takes many forms, but it always remains the same, dividing wall. Now in our own society today, we too construct walls. There are many walls that divide us as people. There are walls that create divisions between black and white. There are walls which divide men and women. There are walls of social status that divide the affluent and the poor. Walls are all around us. But for many, they bring a sense of comfort, a sense of protection. Humankind must love walls, for we have built so many of them. We live in a wall-weary world. Now, in the reading this morning, Paul is writing to the believers gathered at the church of Ephesus. He emphasizes the blessings that are only found in Jesus Christ. And he reminds these Christians from whence they came. You were dead in your sin, from Ephesians 2, chapter, verse 1. God is not about separation. God is, about, is not about division. God is about building, building a body of believers, building his church. But as any good construction worker will tell you, before you build, some things need to go. Now here are Paul's words to the church fr uh, from to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body of human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Now, Paul starts this passage by saying, remember the wall. Remember the wall of separation. Paul's talking to the non-Jews. In other words, Gentiles, just like us. Uncircumcised was a disrespectful term used by the Jews. The chosen to describe the unchosen. When Paul speaks of the dividing wall in our text, his primary reference was the five foot high wall between the court of the Gentiles and the court of women in the temple of Jerusalem. On this wall appeared an often repeated inscription to the Gentiles warning them not to go any deeper into the temple grounds. If they did, they would only have themselves to blame for their death, which would inevitably follow. This wall represents prejudice, which was a burning issue between the Jews and the Gentiles. Some ancient Jewish writings even go far as referring to Gentiles as the fuel for the fires of hell. Now imagine how difficult it must have been for either group to extend the other hand, a hand of fellowship. Now in our text, Paul is speaking to Gentile believers. They were Gentiles by birth, but they were now Christians 
part of the church of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. Paul tells them to remember. Remember when they were separated from God. To remember the wall. The wall that had separated them in the past. Separation from God is the very definition of spiritual death. An eternal death. So why does Paul want them to remember? Purely because one needs to remember. We need to remember how we were lost before Christ. We need to remember the walls of separation. We need to remember so that we do not, as followers of Christ, build them again. In 1949, four years following the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II, the nation of Germany was divided east and west. In the east, a communist government was established under the influence of the Soviet Union. In the west, a free democratic government was established and benefited greatly from the Marshall Plan and the economics of free enterprise. Life became much better for the German citizens who lived in the west. Now, the city of Berlin became an example of where these divided philosophies would literally divide the city. Fearful of losing its citizens, East Germany closed the border between the two states in 1952. But that did not stop an estimated 2.5 million East Germans from fleeing to West Germany between 1949 and 1961. So in 1961, the East German government built the Berlin Wall. The wall stood for almost 30 years as a very real and symbolic divide between the East and the West. I still remember the speech by President Ronald Reagan in 1987 at the Brandenburg Gate, a section of the Berlin Wall. Now, during the height of the Cold War, President Reagan used the opportunity to encourage freedom and a new peace. His words remain so clear to me even to this day. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And a short time later, the wall was literally torn down. And in November 1987, the Germans from both the East and the West scaled the wall and danced in celebration as the walls came tumbling down. Now, one cannot get closer to God and at the same time remain distant from others. Paul goes on to share with the Ephesians that he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. That's from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. Paul's emphasis is that Christ himself is our peace. Christ has torn down the wall that had divided for so long. Now, we typically think of peace as being the absence of war, but that is not the kind of peace that Paul is talking about. Peace is not just the absence of hostility. It is much, much more. It has its roots in the Old Testament concept of the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom is a much more comprehensive term for salvation and life with God. It means wholeness, completeness, well-being, prosperity, in other words, shalom is the way things should be. It is God's ideal. Christ has restored the ideal by destroying the wall and bringing both Jew and Gentile together. Notice the two, both Jew and Gentile, are made one in him. His purpose was to create out of the two one new creation, a new creation in Christ Jesus, thus bringing about shalom, true peace, God's peace. We were walled away from God, but Jesus tore down that wall. With the barriers gone, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave and free have full access to the royal throne of God. In order to build, one must first tear down. Now this site, us, this fleshly body must be cleared of all walls. Then and only then will we receive true shalom, true peace. And this shalom, this peace is both vertical and it is also horizontal between us. The vertical being between us and God. Now for many, especially followers of the Christ, believe that religion is a personal thing that only happens when a person is alone with God. 
Yet the vertical relationship with God can only express itself in the horizontal relationship with others. Christianity is to be lived out in community. It is, is to be lived out among others. We must empty ourselves and let Jesus fill us anew. It's about the makeup of your heart. Your heart. It's, it's about the substance of your heart. It's about what you allow to encompass and fill your heart. Story goes of a young African boy who was watching a balloon seller at the local fete. He was obviously a very good salesman because he allowed a red balloon to escape and soar high up into the air, thereby drawing a whole number of people to his stall. Next, he re re released a blue one, then a yellow one, then a white one. They all went soaring up into the sky until they each disappeared. The young boy stood looking at the black balloon that the man was holding in his hand. He then asked, Sir, if you let the black balloon up, will it go as high as the others? Now, the, loop, the balloon man gave the boy an understanding smile. He snapped the string that held the black balloon and let it go, and it soared upwards. He said, son, it isn't the color. It's what's inside that makes it rise. It's what in, is inside us that will make you rise. It's all about the substance of the heart. It's about what is on the inside. It's all about Jesus. When you accept Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, He enters you and the scripture tells you that you are a new creation. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Bring down the walls. Be filled to overflowing with the presence, with the peace of Jesus. Allow the maker of the universe to mold you, to fill you anew to fill you with his presence. For it is what is on the inside that makes you rise. It's what fills you on the inside that gives you peace. And it is that peace that allows you to fully experience the shalom of God. Amen.